Welcome to the unknown, a place where ghosts, cryptids, and extraterrestrials are sought. This is where you'll find answers to questions about what lurks in the dark. This is Periscope Uncensored. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Periscope Uncensored on WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Alabama. I'm Clarissa Vasquez. Riding shotgun this evening, as always, is the man who makes ghosts holla for those spectral dollars, Mr. Menage Spook himself, Joe White. How you doing, everybody? We have got a great show lined up for you tonight, folks. Uh, We are going to have Ronnie Headley from Tennessee Paranormal on the line with us. And uh, he was recently on an episode of Kindred Spirits. Uh, He did a Native American cleansing on a location, if I understand correctly. And so uh, we're going to have him on the line uh, to talk about his research and his television experience uh, after our break here coming up in about 20 minutes. But um, big news in the paranormal field. Yes. Big news in the paranormal field. And I'm not just talking about my investigation last weekend. I'm talking about the return dun, 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 of, <laughs> of America's, uh, dare I say, America's favorite ghost hunters? Um, well, technically, no, because it's not, not going to be ghost hunters, correct? It's not going to be ghost hunters, but... Uh, it was announced this week that um, Jason Hawes and Steve Gonzalez and Dave Tango are bringing a brand new paranormal investigation show to the Travel Channel. And the working title of that show, I, I forget what the working title of that show is. Um, it'll it'll come to me here in a minute. It, the, the official show title has not been officially determined correct uh but it was i can i can look it up here real quick um it is called ghost nation working ghost title nation. for now yes ghost nation ghost nation on the travel channel and you joe brought something really interesting uh up this afternoon when i did when you asked if if you, if I thought that Jason Hawes and Mr. Too Tight T-shirt, you know, were going to be competing on the Travel Channel, you know, having you know having two uh, very popular uh, paranormal investigation programs on the same network, uh, yes. What what do you think about that? I actually think that <laughs> we're going to have like. World War 15, I think. You think? I think. I do, because considering, okay, I mean, originally, Ghost Hunters was, was it. They, they, you know, they were essentially, you know, the godfather of the paranormal TV show. And, and the other show took off after maybe like five years, six years after, mm-hmm. or six seasons after. And I think that both of them being on the same network and with uh, with egos in play, mm-hmm. yes, I think they're going to be at war. I don't even think it's going to be an ego issue. You know, there are some diehard TAPS fans. And some diehard Ghost Hunters fans. And so, you know, when Ghost Hunters went off the air, a lot of those Taps and Ghost Hunters fans, you know, started watching GAC, started watching Ghost Adventures. And I think Ghost Adventures ratings are going to drop um, once Paranormal or what, Ghost Nation, is that what it's called? Once it, once yes. it launches. Um because those diehard fans are going to 
you know, go back to what they know and what they love. So uh, I'm not saying I'm going to watch either of the shows because you know I don't watch the paranormal TV shows. Um, I think they're bunk, but I think, I think it's going to be a ratings war. Yeah. I mean, uh, Oh, and you're breaking out. Uh, uh, <laughs> okay, I guess I won't read the thing. Okay, no, go ahead. You're back now. Well, that's because I logged off. Ah, uh, yeah, it's it's when you multitask on your device that that you start breaking out. Um, can you no, hear me I, now? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. <laughs> All new travel t- channel uh, travel channel series come, and you're gone again. So, I will see if I can find that article, and uh, I'll see if I can get it read uh, for our listeners that haven't uh, seen it yet. But um, it was, I I can't say that I was surprised to see. You know that they were trying that they're trying to come back. Um, oh and- no, not at all, not at all. Because about like five months ago, he issued a statement saying that he was bringing back the TV show, and what network would everyone like to see the TV show brought back on? Right. And I did not dream of it being on Travel Channel. I mean, they've been on Sci-Fi for so long. Mm-hmm. And at one point, there was only one member of TAPS, and that was himself. And that was the past few years. Yeah. And um, I've got the article here. From uh, bloodydisgusting.com is actually the the article that, that I have located. And if I can get it to open. Okay, it says the mega, mega popular series Ghost Hunters may be no more, but the Travel Channel just announced today that stars Jason Hawes, Dave Tango, and Steve Gonzalez have been brought back together for a brand new paranormal investigation series titled Ghost Nation. In Ghost Nation, the trio returns to television by popular demand for all new explorations of the other side. But now, a whole nation of paranormal investigators is at their fingertips. Each week on Ghost Nation, the team will rally their troops and reconnoiter, that's not a word I'm familiar with, around the most intriguing cases that need the benefit of their expertise. Armed with state-of-the-art technology, Haas, Gonzalez, and Tango will attempt to uncover paranormal evidence like never before. And, of course, my screen just decided to go wonky. There we go. Uh, Like never before, while also debunking false claims. But on these bigger and bolder investigations, the team will also endeavor to track down the true source of these hauntings, and restore peace and order among the living and the dead. And it's set to premiere sometime in 2019. So sometime this year. It's <coughs> they're they're coming back. So um, well according to Haas himself, he said this fall. I'm guessing probably around Halloween. Yeah. That would be a decent time frame. Yeah. So, and, you know, also in the world of the strange and unusual, um, scientists revealed the first photo ever uh, of a black hole in space. Yes. And, you know, we've, we've quote unquote known about the existence of black holes. But we haven't had actual proof other than, you know, like radio waves and, and, and other data, you know, to actually, you know, mark their existence. You know, when, when Einstein published his theory of relativity, 
1915, you know, that was when, you know, black holes, you know, first became a thing, um, thanks to Einstein's theory. And so for the last 104 years, you know, scientists have been working to try to find tangible proof of their existence. And yesterday morning, they did it. It took uh, hundreds of scientific researchers and at least a half a dozen telescopes and satellite dishes, you know, around the around the globe. Um, and it took them 10 days to gather the data and they couldn't even uh, send the data to the to the analysis site via the Internet. They had to download it on hard drives and snail mail the hard drives <laughs> to I think it was Boston um, to so they could, you know, get it all together, get it analyzed, get it uh, collaborated with the ultimate result being one singular photograph of a black hole and it's not even in our galaxy. They no. said the the one black hole that's in our galaxy um was would have been more difficult to photograph because the light sources um that illuminate it are dimmer than the one that they photographed which I think they said was 55 million light years away or something like that. It was crazy. Yeah, 53, yeah. M 87, I believe it's called. Messier 87 is the name of the galaxy. Yeah. And so, you know, that has, you know, really lit a fire under the butts of, you know, scientific researchers. But it's also kind of lit a fire um, in the paranormal community as well. Because, you know, whether whether people are looking for ghosts or cryptids or extraterrestrials or tangible um, proof of extrasensory abilities. Um, you know, the paranormal researchers are going, well, you know, it took them 104 years to photograph a black hole. You know, so, mm. you know, let's keep at it. Let's keep going and, yeah. you know, see what we can you know, see what we can uncover, what we can come up with, what we can present to the world. And so, you know, really exciting stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I mean, who knows what, I mean, they claim that every galaxy has a, has a black hole where they actually come up with that theory. I have no idea. Yeah. Yeah, um, and I I think that the term black hole stems from the you know, the negative space you know within the vacuum uh, when they you know when they first started speculating and theorizing you know what this anomaly would look like um, you know and the existence of light at its core. Um, I think that's how they came up with the term black hole. Uh, but the one that they photographed is actually called a supermassive black hole. And uh, Twilight fans around the world are going to get that song in their head now. Uh, <laughs> but um, no, it's, it's really, it, it's really exciting because, you know, researchers and, and again, this is, it doesn't just apply to the field of paranormal research. Uh, you know, it applies to scientific research everywhere. And when you think about it, you know, our advances in technology and, and the, the genius IQs that have, that have come along in the last 104 years, you know, it only took them 104 years to develop the technology, you know, put together the project and execute the plan which is pretty significant considering, you know, we're just puny humans. Puny. Yes. <laughs> I agree with that assessment. So, um, and since we've got five minutes before we uh, go on our break, um, I can talk a little bit about uh, last weekend's investigation. 
which, which you got to be privy to uh, via Facebook video chat, Joe. Um, and, you know, I was I was sending you a couple of pieces here and there. Um, we also went live a couple of times on our Facebook page um, and uh, played a, an audio recording that we gathered that night. Um, we got one solid audio recording. Um, so far we're not done going through our data but we've got one solid audio recording so far Um, and it was during an experiment using REM pods and we had two REM pods set up and explained you know that one was for yes and one was for no and that we were you know we were asking a series of questions that required yes or no answers and one of my investigators asked if the entity in question was a woman, yes or no. And we did not get a REM pod response, but what we did get was an audio bite um, of a woman's voice saying woman. (laughs) Uh, Yes. So, you know, it, it would have validated things a little bit if we'd had REM pod activity, you know, in conjunction. But um, the fact remains we did get, a clear class A response um, to a direct question. We got a direct answer to a question, um, and that was really exciting. Uh, we got some SLS uh, footage, which I think I've debunked all of that, and we got one photograph using um, a full spectrum camera that we have debunked and rebunked and debunked and rebunked uh, at least two dozen times. Uh, over the last few days, uh, it's it seems like every time we get it debunked, then you know something comes along and it gets rebunked, and and, and then then we debunk it again, and you know uh, different camera angles or you know additional photographic evidence comes to light, and we rebunk it. So we are still in the process of uh, analyzing that particular photograph. Uh, and we were uh, we were at the museum in Glenwood Springs, Colorado. We were at the Frontier Historical Museum in Glenwood Springs, Colorado. Finally, um, we got to investigate that location, and uh, it didn't let us down. It, it did not let us down, and uh, our resident skeptic was even you know jumping up and down and squealing like a little kid and (laughs) yeah and and he and i actually went back to the museum this morning and took some daylight photographs you know to use you know for comparison you know kind of see what things look like in the daylight you know to compare to this one photograph in question and the photograph looks to be um, a man uh, that is not wearing the CCPI uniform um, and different features on him. Um, It almost looks like a man wearing a firefighter's uniform. Uh, And how that is significant is this July will be the 25th anniversary of the Storm King fire here in, in Glenwood Springs. And 14 firefighters died. Uh, The winds shifted. It was a wildfire and the winds shifted. Um, They were trying to protect the town and uh, they were trapped, essentially. So 14 firefighters died. And the historical society in the basement of the museum has been digging up all of the old Storm King memorabilia and all of the archives and news footage and uh, photographs and newspaper articles. And so when you take the fact that they've been stirring up all of that archival uh, data, you know, plus the fact that the photograph in question almost looks like a firefighter, um, you know, it makes you wonder, you know, is that what we captured? But then when you go back and look at other things, it's like, okay, maybe that was one of the investigators on site. And the fact that we were using a, a full spectrum camera, which has a slower shutter, um, you know, it could have uh, distorted things and, you know, given the other 
um, objects in the room. And again, the fact that we were using a full spectrum camera, so things aren't going to be in color. They're going to be in shades of red and black. Um, you know, it, it could just be um, pareidolia. It could be an investigator, you know, combined with other objects in the room, uh, slow shutter and, you know, different shades of red and black, um, you know, making it look like we've got a photograph of a burned firefighter. So, um, interesting. Yep. But it is time for our first break of the evening. But when we come back, we're going to have Ronnie Headley on the line. So stay tuned, folks. You're listening to Periscope Uncensored on WBHM Digital Broadcasting, and we will be right back. Son of a... Hey, son. Mother... <laughs> uh, son, what are you doing? Hey, Mom. I'm getting ready to listen to Periscope Uncensored. By expanding your vocabulary. Well, it is uncensored. Son, the uncensored part of Periscope Uncensored is Jax and I getting down to brass tacks with all aspects of the paranormal. There's no fluff on our show. So, no off-color commentary? I didn't say that. Awesome! (laughs) Son? Uh, I just hit my head. Oh boy, I'll go get you an ice pack. Catch Periscope Uncensored Thursday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern, only on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. Welcome back to Periscope Uncensored on WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Alabama. I'm Clarissa Vasquez. Riding shotgun this evening is the man who puts the ooh in boo, Mr. Joe White. How you doing, everybody? And we have got a great guest on the line this evening. Uh, this gentleman is uh, hes uh, really uh, doing some positive things in the in the field of paranormal investigation um he and his team tennessee paranormal uh have been uh leading investigations at uh historic locations and uh they've been uh doing a lot of other things and you'll have to forgive me um uh because i'm still trying to get the bio pulled up here there we go um He's the founder and lead investigator of Tennessee Paranormal. Uh, At an early age, he began to feel intuitive to the unexplained and a strong connection to the earth. His Native American ancestry was the catalyst for his foray into the unexplained. Uh, He's worked with many state and federal agencies, such as the Alabama Historical Commission, in locating graves and archaeological sites. His interest in the paranormal peaked when he encountered his first apparition while working as a funeral director. During his many years as a funeral director, he continued to have paranormal experiences, and in the years since, he's been on several investigative teams in Alabama and Tennessee. He's investigated places such as Dead Children's Playground, Lynchburg Funeral Home, Walking Horse Inn, Brushy Mountain Penitentiary, an antebellum home, and Battlefield in Spring Hill, and several private residences. He's been interviewed on many podcasts, such as Beyond the Darkness Radio, where Dave Schrader discussed a, discussed paranormal from a Native American perspective, an occupation nation where he was interviewed on how to become a professional investigator and answered questions about his personal experiences. He was also on the Travel Channel on the show Kindred Spirits, Season 3, Episode 6, for those who are wanting to know. Uh, Blood in the Water at Hales Bar Dam earlier this month, where he was asked to perform a traditional Native American prayer and offering. He and his team continue to host public historical and ghost walking tours at Henry Horton State Park, as well as overnight investigations using some of the most advanced technology available. They continue to do uh, private investigations upon request. So please join us in welcoming Mr. Ronnie Headley to the show. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Thank you, guys. Now, your the bio that you sent us uh, said that you began to have um, intuitive experiences, and and you felt a strong connection to the earth. Um, so, and then later as an adult, when you were working as a funeral director, you had your first uh, encounter with uh, an apparition. So, what made you decide? You know, hey, I want to, you know, I I want to investigate these things. I want to. Uh, I, I want to be a paranormal investigator. It was just, you know, the curiosity of what was happening and, and things that I was feeling, seeing, and that kind of thing, and just trying to 
actually being a funeral director and seeing the apparition and that sort of thing of wanting to kind of peek through the veil and try to find out what is on the other side. Awesome. And how long have you been doing that then? Uh, I've been doing this since uh, early 80s. Since the early 80s. Wow. Okay, so you're a veteran in the field, uh, much like myself and Joe. Um, how would you say then that that the field of paranormal investigation has changed since you first started, and do you feel it's changed for the better? Uh, when I first got started, and you guys, you know, if, if you've been in quite a while too, you know, back then it was kind of taboo to taboo to just kind of you know be dabbing in that, and you didn't talk a whole lot of it, and every once in a while the same thing, and you'd kind of say, you know, hey, uh, you know, let's let's compare notes here. But over the years, as it's progressed, it got more and more uh, publicity on TV. As it got more publicity on TV, um, mm -hmm. just kind of, you know, uh, more and more people have come to enjoy it, be interested in it, and just go out on weekends themselves trying to find something. And so do you feel that the, that the field as a whole um, has changed for the better then? with the removal of the stigma and it being less taboo than it was 30 years ago? I think so. And with the more and more uh, people getting into it and the more and more mod modern technology that we have, uh, that we're ap actually able to look at things scientifically and more uh, like our team, we pride ourselves on separating ourselves from what I call just ghost hunters where just a group of friends just go out on the weekends and being a professional investigator where you go at it at a scientific approach of trying to prove that, you know, we look at things and try to debunk it and prove what it's not before we say what it is. Um, so with the new approaches of technology, every day there's something being invented. These guys are just, you know, going off the chain with, with some of the equipment that they're coming out with today. Yeah, that it, it's and, crazy. And being, have, go ahead, Jeff. And and being back then, thirty years ago, there wasn't really much, you know, equipment to investigate the paranormal either. Oh, absolutely. Would you not. say? No, sir. You know, um, best thing you could do. You know, they had the disc cameras. The digital disc cameras were coming out back about that time, and that was like. You know, one of the best things you could could use was trying to take quick photos in different areas and try to capture uh, something that way, uh, you know. Um, but from where, it, where it's grown from that area of just sitting there trying to talk and listen and see what you could find with a camera to, you know, uh, the SLS cameras that they've got today, complete with, you know, geo ports and, and, you know, all of the recording equipment that we've got today just... It's amazing the difference in it. Uh, you mentioned the SLS camera. What is your um, take on the SLS camera? Uh, our team has several of them, and uh, we love them. Uh, we use a, uh, a program that we use and everything in it. We can set one up on each side of the room and actually recreate the room in three dimension, and uh, we like doing that. Um, the program has, you know, just regular camera, night vision, and, um, you know, the 3D effect and everything on it where we turn everything into stick figures and that kind of thing with it. But uh, a couple of my teammates are uh, professional firefighters, and they're arson investigators. So like I was saying, using the the uh, scientific approach and, you know, uh, they're, they're my my kind of skeptics. They believe, but they, they're the skeptic approach to it of, you know, we're going to prove this is, isn't before we prove it is. So uh, these guys are just amazing with what they can can do with those type cameras. Yeah, you, you have to. You definitely have to have a sense of skepticism in this field and try to find natural phenomena for said activity that's going on. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, uh, you're talking about the SLS cameras and and you know our secure uh, security camera system that we use. That's you know. It's got a timestamp on it. We use uh, an SB box that's got uh, a timestamp on it, and we use um, uh, other devices and everything. And so if we hear something at, say, 7 p.m. Uh, on our recorder, then we can go over to 
uh, the cameras at 7 p.m., see if we captured something, and then go back over to the EBI and see if we had any vibrations, temperature drops, and things like that. So, you know, we've got three ways of documenting to prove something was or wasn't. And uh, that's the kind of scientific approach that our group tries to, to maintain those those standards. Awesome. Now, you mentioned that you try to keep things as scientific as possible. Uh, do you then uh, utilize uh, uh, people with uh, extrasensory abilities or psychic mediums during investigations? Um, you know, I came from old school, and, you know, you guys talking about the same thing. Back then, you know, there were a few people that you saw on TV that were psychics and mediums that um, worked with the police departments and everything with solving, you know, cold cases or finding someone that was lost and everything. And I do believe in that. But there were, there were just a handful back then. Now you're looking at hundreds and thousands of them everywhere you look, you know, you got these psychic people out there. Uh, so it makes me, you know... Looking from a scientific point, yes, I can take a piece of equipment and I can prove what I just saw. Um, when you talk to people that are psychic and everything else, that's just what you know, what they say, what they saw, or what they heard. So you can't actually use a person and do it scientifically. You know, it's just their word. And uh, talking with several other professional investigators that's been on TV going out to taking some tours with these guys and everything. Um, one of the things that we talked about was, you know, um, I can tell you all day long what I've seen, what I've heard and everything else. And, but those are my experiences. Unless you come out and you, you take a tour or you go somewhere and investigate and you have something, that's when it becomes your experiences that you can prove without a shadow of doubt in your mind. If that makes sense to you guys. It does. It does. It's almost like it's as, just because you have, I'm sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Well, what I was saying is, you know, we follow the premise that you can't prove the paranormal with the paranormal. Right. Yeah. You know, and to us, right. uh, you know, extrasensory, abilities, you know, because they in and of themselves cannot be scientifically proven, um, fall into the category of paranormal. So, um, you know, you, you can't prove the paranormal with the paranormal. Now, if you've got, you know, someone who says, you know, I'm, I, I'm sensing a woman standing over in that corner and you capture a photograph of, you know, what looks like a woman or you, get an EVP of a woman's voice, you know, over in that area, you know, that's a little bit of validation. Um, exactly. Exactly. But, you know, what I'm saying is, and I agree totally. I mean, you know, uh, there's, there's just no way to prove what somebody's telling you unless you have those type things to back it up. And I'm not saying they don't exist. Don't get me wrong. I, I'm not saying they don't exist because, you know, I've, I've seen cold cases and everything else solved by these folks. But I just think with the progression of everything and the interest in it and, and television and building ratings and all for your programs and everything where every team on TV now has a, has a psychic or medium that they use on these programs and everything. And I think that more and more people are just wanting to, uh, to come out as that, um, you know, um, I, but like I said, you know, I look at things from the scientific point. That's what I want to look at. That's what makes our team different is because we want to prove it scientifically, you know. Um, yeah, that's outstanding. And so so then you, your organization in particular, you know, you rely heavily on the equipment then um, and the technology um, do you go through trying to have your own experiences or do you go through uh, first trying to debunk the client's claims or the reported activity at the location? Well, like I told you, you know, I've got guys that are arson investigators and everything else, uh, being a paramedic and everything for many years myself. Uh, you know, you, you learn to read people a lot of times and everything. So we've developed a way that if we're contacted, 
they make the initial contact with me. I go through, talk to people, uh, jot down the notes and everything on it, and I tell them I'm going to send them a survey. So we've got this uh, survey that we send to them, you know, asking them about what they've seen, how many people's in their house, you know, are you on any kind of medications, do you do this, do you do that, you know, mm-hmm. and just get the get the lowdown on on the the client first, and then I tell them that I'm going to have another one of my teammates, since an arson investigator, that he contacts them, and then he goes through the process of asking questions, and, you know, that's his job. He does that daily, you know. Uh, he, he works for a fire department and then um, also is an investigator for insurance companies and everything, so he travels around doing this, so he interviews people all the time. So he'll do a second inter- interview, and then we'll we'll call each other and get together and kind to go through everything and see if we get the same answers or what was your feelings when you listened to them, you know, what what were you getting uh, out of it. And then we go from there. We set up a time and everything to go out and actually, uh, you know, do an investigation. Now, given that you have been on, on television very recently, have you noticed an uptick in uh, – contact from individuals, you know, wanting to either talk to you or uh, wanting you to come and investigate their location? Uh, yes. I mean, we've had, had quite a few recently, and then we did a uh, – the state park down uh, here had a spring uh, spring fest day, and we went and did that, and it's like everybody was coming in, you know, I've got this in my house, I've got this, I've got this. And so, you know, we were giving them cards and everything to contact us and start lining up on it. Uh, I actually had a uh, a radio station a gentleman that does a podcast for Paranormal out of Illinois contact me and asked me would I go into Kentucky that a lady called in on his show and had something going on. And so we went there, and uh, she was being scratched and all these kind of things. So uh, I actually went up there and performed uh, some ceremonies and, and prayers and everything there with them and uh, talked to her last Friday night, um, and she was telling me that since came in and did all that, everything's gone back to normal, not having any problems anymore. So we do get quite a few contacts. You know, that's great. You know, with the, you know, the sense of accomplishment that you get. You know, when you're able to go in and, you know, and actually help a person, you know, who, who may or may not. Um, be experiencing legitimate paranormal phenomena, you know, but they believe that they are. And, you know, when you can go in and, you know, and provide them some, some peace of mind, um, you know, to me, that makes it all worth it. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, that's, that's what we're in the business for is, you know, trying to, trying to prove, but uh, also trying to help others, you know, understand or, or help them with problems such as this. Yeah, for sure. Um, now, do you have people that come to you um, and and ask, you know, uh, are you affiliated with, you know, one of the people on television? You know, are, like uh, the 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 calls that we get, you know, they they ask if we're affiliated with people on television because they want to be on television. Do you guys get those also? Yeah, you know, you you get on. Oh, I watch this, or do you know these guys, or do you do this? You know. Uh, so yeah, we get we get some of those, uh, and you know we're. I was sitting at home and got a call from from uh, New York and thought it actually thought it was a telemarketer when when they called me and told me that you know they had kindred spirits. Uh, Amy and Adam were going to be at Hell's Bar Dam, and since I had Native American uh, background, and everything would I come in and and work with them? They had something going on there, and I, I agreed to go up there and do that for them. So, you know, it's just uh, – uh, but then you turn around and get these people that that do, you know, look at it that way of, you know, who do you know? And, and, right. And can, can, can you get me introduced to them and that kind of thing, you know? Right. Um, was that a last-minute booking for you with the with the Kindred Spirits show? Uh, ab- absolutely. Um, a friend of mine uh, off the – Cherokee Reservation up in North Carolina said, hey, they're looking for somebody here and uh, sent me the information on it. So I just uh, sent uh, Amy a response, you know, that you know, I was Native American and into the paranormal as a professional investigator and everything. 
you know, what were they looking for? And that's when I got the call. It was like the next morning I got the call from New York. Outstanding. Well, it is time for our next break of the evening, but when we come back, we're going to have more with Ronnie. So stay tuned, folks. You're listening to Periscope Uncensored on WBHM, and we will be right back. Welcome back to Periscope Uncensored on WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Alabama. I'm Clarissa Vasquez, and riding shotgun this evening is the apple in my dumplings, Mr. Joe White. Hey, how you doing, everybody? And, folks, we've got a great guest on the line tonight. Uh, He is the uh, founder and lead investigator of Tennessee Paranormal, which is obviously out of Tennessee. (laughs) Uh, But, you know, he's also uh, done a little bit of television work and uh, is providing a great service, you know, to his community uh, in in the area of paranormal research and uh, you know, providing assistance to people who believe they are having um, encounters with unseen beings. So please join us in welcoming uh, Mr. Ronnie Headley back to the show. Thanks, guys. And uh, Ronnie, before we went to break, we were talking about you know the technology um, that you guys use and how you have arson investigators uh, on your on your team uh, to help, you know, not only deal with clients, uh, but also, you know, thoroughly and scientifically, as scientifically as possible, um, investigate what the clients and what you guys are experiencing. Um, So would you consider the investigators on your team to be the greatest asset that you guys have, or uh, is there a piece of equipment that you guys tend to favor? Well, uh, you know, with people wise, yes, they're they're a great asset. Um, we can go in. What we try to do is we take every team member as you know as important as the next. We go in and and assign each team member something a job. You know, um, whether it's you know going in and looking up the history or that kind of thing. Um, with the uh, the two gentlemen that are in arson investigators and everything. Uh, They've got access where they can go in and pull up, you know, medical records and things like this that's happened on the property. So, you know, we can go in if we get a, you know, something happening there, we can go in and say, okay, was there murder there? Was there suicide there? What was there, you know, prior to this by going in to pull up uh, tax records and things like that or historical societies, you know. Up here in, in Tennessee, we have a lot of, like, county historical societies, so you can go to them and pull up. Uh, you can go to the newspaper and pull up the archives and everything. So, you know, we have people that go do all of that before we actually go out on an investigation. We'd like to try to dig as deep as we can into it and see what we might have there. That's, that's great. That's actually phenomenal because, yeah, because yeah, that's, I mean, I think I think that's all part of the investigation is when you, you go and pull up these records and, you have this information that's all part of the history and and of the any particular location and i t- think that just a whole thing as a whole is is all part of the investigation oh absolutely it uh it adds to the validation if you find something you know that you know if something's happened there or you know uh you find out you know it was uh, Native American site for hunting or Native Native American barrel site or, you know, whatever you've got in the area, uh, even in this area of, of Tennessee, I mean, there's like tons and tons and tons of, of civil war around this area. So, you know, when you find out what battle or what skirmish, it doesn't even have to be a battle, it can be a skirmish, you know, uh, and, and that kind of thing that happened in the areas, you know, it gives you more insight for what you might be dealing with on these these properties. Most definitely. Um, Mm -hmm. So then when you guys look at, you know, the historical aspect of a location, uh, do you, do you then treat it in, in the same period with the same methods um, as the period in which you're dealing? Or do you, you know, try to use more modern methods than to, to deal with, you know, what you're, what you're encountering? We use, uh, you know, we use all our most modern technology and everything for our investigations with our camera setups and our, you know, our geoports and 
uh, SB7s and, and uh, you know, all of the K2 meters and male meters and all this kind of stuff, We you know. But um, say, for instance, if I knew it was going to be 1800s and it might be a child involved in it, I'm not going to put out something new, you know, modern age toy or candy or something like that. I'm going to go back to a candy from that time period, you know, where there'd be a mint or a piece of hard candy or, you know, the little wafers and, or mm-hmm. what licorice, you know, something to that time period, something that they would relate to. Right. Uh, a top or a ball or a little doll for a little girl or something, you know, uh, but nothing, you know, that kind of thing. Right. And I think a lot of investigators kind of take that for granted. You know, they're, oh, you know, we're dealing with a child, you know, we're going to go get, you know, a, a Snickers bar, mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, you know, or, you know, or, you know, I, I have an iPad or, you know, do you want to play with it? You know, and, exactly. and you know, and a, a child from the 1800s, you know, will probably be fearful mm-hmm. of, exactly. you know, of what the investigator is offering. Sure. Uh, did an investigation one time in a, in a schoolhouse, and I had, you know, my recorder sitting up on the de- teacher's desk there with the lights on it and everything. And I'm like, you know, don't be afraid, you know, and I apologize, you know, if I can't hear you and you're talking to me because where you're from, I can't hear you. But if you, the little red light on the desk up there, if you'll speak into it, then when I play it back, I can hear you. And if you ask me a question, I'll come back and answer it for you later. And as soon as I said that and, and played the recorder back, as soon as I said that, sounded like a little girl about eight or nine years old saying, hello, hello, into the recorder. So, you know. Uh, we just try to explain to wow. them you know, what what the equipment is and that kind of thing, you know, um, and let them know that it's not there to harm them. Same thing right. with us. We we go in, you know. You see a lot on TV where they challenge or, or you know those kind of tactics. We don't do that. If we're conducting a public investigation, we'll tell the people that'll be the first thing that gets you, you know, put off of here is if you're out challenging and trying to be you know, rude and everything. These people were living at one time. They were somebody's mother, brother, son, daughter. You know, be respectful to these people. You're in their house, you know, and that's what we try to do. Most definitely. Um, I had another question, and I just lost it. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's not It's not your fault. Um, yeah, Wait, you I, have... Go ahead, Joe. Ronnie, you have Native American ancestry, correct? Yes. Okay. From, uh, Cher- um, Cherokee. No. Okay. Um, have you ever had to consult a, a shaman, so to speak, to help out with investigations? Um, no, sir. Uh, Cherokees didn't have shamans. Uh, shaman okay. was, you know, like the other, other areas. Uh, we did have priests and everything, but uh, that was many, many years ago. Um, I have many, I have connections to both the, the nation and and the Eastern Band Cherokee. I have friends in both places. A lot of uh, a lot of traditionalist uh, friends of mine. They've a lot of them have crossed over now, but uh, uh, we're good enough to teach me some of the the ceremonies and some of the meanings and share a lot of the stories and stuff with me about the the history and and those kind of things so um learned learned a lot in that in that perspective of it and um then uh that's when i i lived in alabama for a while and uh was actually uh clan chief of one of the oldest and largest state recognized tribes in alabama for about six years down there. Oh wow, that's really cool. Wow. So, you mentioned earlier, you know, that you captured the EVP of the little girl going "hello, hello." Um, you know, would would that be one of your most compelling pieces of data to date, or do you oh, no. do you have something? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no. What then um, would be your most compelling piece of data? Actually, it's three pieces of data, and it was just totally blew me away. And we were on another team, and we did a uh, at one time. You know, I've been on before I uh, started the team here, uh, and some of our teammates that 
was on my team now, we were on this team, and um, we were in a historical battlefield and, and home and everything. And when I would go in, like I said, you know, I always treat them with respect, and I always go in and say good evening and call them all by name, and this is Ronnie. I've been here many times before in your home. And uh, tonight I brought some friends, and we're going to be asking questions, and if you would, we'd appreciate you answering. And if you ask us questions, I apologize. You know, sometimes we can't hear you. But if I play the recorder back, I'll come back and, and let you know. So we're lights out, and there's a stairwell that goes up. And on both sides is another stairwell that goes up to the second level, you know, on the landing there. So I'm standing on the landing because we're lights out, and I've got a flashlight, and I'm carrying them up one by one, telling them, you know, I'll meet you on the top landing, just stand right there. And this lady comes by, and she asked me a question. And just as soon as I answered her question on the recorder when we played it back, we captured Hi, Ronnie. And so, I mean, that just totally amazed me that we caught that. So the next time that we had an investigation, I couldn't make it that night, and one of the teammates captured an EVP that says, where's Ronnie? And then the next time we went, one of the teammates said, you ask about Ronnie, he's back tonight. We actually captured one that says, I see him. So those are my three most wow. amazing to me. <laughs> so. Wow. That is cool. <laughs> it blew, blew me away, you know. Yeah. So. Yeah, because, you know, Ronnie is not that common of a name, of, you know, of a, of a first name. Um, right. You know, it's, it's more common, say, than Clarissa. But, um, you know, it's, it's not um, so common that, you know, like, like Bob or, you know, or something where, sure. where something can be misinterpreted uh, as being, you know, oh, you know, he, he said my name. Uh, and so that's, that's actually, that's really exciting that you were able to have that experience and, you know, and have that, that interaction, that almost first person interaction. Uh, it just blew me away. And I mean, that's to me to date, this, that's still the most amazing evidence that I've actually gotten out of all oh, the years yeah. I'm in this. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, That's outstanding. Today, today we do an investigation at the state park here in Tennessee. Um, and if you want to tell you guys about that, I'll be glad to. Uh, We've got about three minutes before our next break. Uh, <laughs> and, and yes, I would love to hear about the state park over there. Um, and uh, but I'm I'm thinking we're running a little short on time sure. for that. No problem. Uh, but uh, you know, definitely when we come back from the break, we'll we'll talk about that. Uh, how many people uh, are part of Tennessee Paranormal right now? Uh, we started out with three. We just added uh, five more, so there's a total of eight people on our team right now. Wow. And are they? Find it, um... Do you find it better or easier with a bigger team, or would you rather have a smaller team? I like a bigger team because, you know, with the firefighters that we've got, we've got two firefighters. They both work different shifts. So if an investigation falls on when they're they're working, then that would short us one you know, or, or possibly two. And so, you know, it's got where we can, you know, we still got people that, that we can go in and have a, a good investigation with. So uh, it it has its its benefits, and um, like I said, you know, we just we just added the uh, five more just a, a few months ago, but um, about a month and a half ago. But uh, it's it's going to work out great. Uh, and when we take and new team members and everything in, we put them on like a, a probationary career to make sure that we're a fit for them, and and they're a fit for us. So excellent. Well, it is time for our top of the hour break, but when we come back, we're going to have more with Ronnie. So stay tuned, folks. You're listening to Periscope Uncensored on WBHM, and we'll be right back. Welcome back to Periscope Uncensored on WBHM, digital broadcasting out of Alabama. I'm Clarissa Vasquez, and riding shotgun this evening is the cream in my Oreo cookie, Mr. Joe White. Hey, how you doing, everybody? And... We're having a great time talking to our guest this evening, uh, Ronnie Headley from Tennessee Paranormal. And, Ronnie, before the break, um, you touched a little bit about the state park 
that you guys uh, regularly um, investigate and are very active in. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit, you know, about that? You know, which state park is it, and uh, you know what's going on there? Okay, it's uh, Henry Horton State Park in Chapel Hill. Uh, we actually do ghost walks, and then uh, where we take you on a two-hour tour and tell you the historical aspect of the park, what the rangers have happened, and what us as a team have, have found, or, or what's happened to guests on the tours and everything. And then we also have, after that, you can choose to go on investigation with us, and we go back to just about all of the locations that we take you on the tour of and investigate with all of our equipment. Um, a couple of years ago, the head ranger came up to me and told me, he says, you know, I know you got, you know, you have a paranormal team and everything, said, would you uh, be interested in coming down here to the park and checking some things out for us and telling me, uh, am I and the rest of my rangers crazy or do we have actually have something going on here? And I said, sure. So we came in and did some investigations and everything, and I, and, uh, I asked him first, I said, uh, what have you got going on? He said, well, the rangers are going into some of the hotel rooms in the inn and everything with their guns drawn because we're here people arguing or door slamming or the switchboard lit up and it's rooms we don't have rented. And he said, we go in there and we don't find anything. We've called the telephone company. They've checked our switchboard and the phones in the room and everything's working good. He said, and, uh, some employees claim they've seen governor Horton walking through the restaurant and one of our rangers, she was coming back from the barn down here to check on our, uh, they rehabilitate hawks and owls and everything, and they had, had them in a barn at the time. So she was coming back. She looked over at one of her cabins, and there's a woman in antebellum clothing standing on the porch. So she radios in and says, hey, guys, you know, do we have a wren fest or something here that I don't know about? And they said, no. Why? And she said, well, there's a lady standing on this cabin over here on the front porch. They said, well, there's guys that's got it rented, and the other cabins there beside it are empty. So she turns around to go to tell, you know, find out what's going on, and the lady just vanishes before her. So um, we have that there. Um, we've had, had the employees will tell you, um, you know, they've had items move. They see things move. They've had things thrown at them. Uh, I've seen shadow figures. The people working in the hotel seen shadow figures. Some of my teammates have. Uh, we captured on one of our cameras. Uh, one of our teammates captured uh, shadow looking like a little boy. Uh, shadow figure running across the back of a room one uh, couple of investigations ago. Uh, we have a haunted spring we take you to, and it's an off-limits area. So at sundown it closes. We take you there after dark, hike out the trail, and go lights out. And uh, it's a haunted spring back there where uh, a slave woman had had a child on her back and was bending over either washing or get, get, gathering water or something like that. And the baby fell into the water and washed out into the river, and they never found her. So she was there. So, I mean, there's just tons and tons and tons of stuff. It has Civil War ties. Uh, it has slavery. It has ties to uh, Andrew Jackson. When he came to Alabama to Horseshoe Bend to fight the Creek War, he actually crossed the river here with his troops into this park. Um, it was, you know, five different, uh, four different tribes actually used it the area here for uh, hunting grounds, shared hunting grounds. Um, President Polk's law office was 11 miles from this park. So you had, uh, when they built a stagecoach line that came through, you had President uh, Jackson and Sam Houston and, and our Sam Davis and, and Davy Crockett and all on the stagecoach going down visiting at, at Polk's law office and talking to Polk and all that came through here. So all of this is documented. Like I said, you know, when we, when we do things, we... We go to historical societies and everything, so when the park rangers came in and asked us, we went in, started finding this stuff, then I went down and spent a lot of time with uh, the lady that's over the historical society here and got all the documentation on all of this. And uh, there's a cemetery there that's got Governor Horton and his wife and his wife's family that uh, that actually owned the property and everything. He inherited it, uh, but uh, Horton inherited it, but... Uh, so it's got the Will Hoyt Horton Cemetery there. But when he when he died, he was actually buried in Lewisburg, which is 11 miles away. And then they disinterred him and moved him up to the Will Hoyt Family Cemetery after uh, after uh, after he died. So 
Uh, okay. I think a lot of it. I think a lot of it with him and everything is because of the being moved and that kind of thing. That's interesting that that you're thinking. You know, being disinterred and reinterred um, is contributing to uh, you know his unrest, if you will. Uh, you know, we have a situation very similar to that out here in Colorado uh, with the grave of gunfighter Kid Curry. And, oh yes, and so uh, you know it's it's neat that you know we're not the only ones experiencing this, uh, right? So y'all have some of the same things happening like that. Yeah, you know. Um, in fact, I was and just you think ex- it's because I, I was just explaining this this morning at the local museum um, mm-hmm. when uh, when Kid Curry um, he was a, a really mean and nasty. Um, gunfighter, um, and it, so he rode with Butch and Sundance for a while, and um, he was so mean they threw him out of the Wild Bunch. You mm-hmm. know, they're, they're like, "This guy's going to get us all killed." Um, and uh, so he robbed a train, was injured, decided that death was better than jail, and killed himself. And so they. Uh, they took a couple of notations of facial features, et cetera, et cetera, and buried him in the local cemetery. Uh, well, a uh, marshal out of Missouri, I think it was, said, you know, that kind of sounds like Kid Curry. And so they dug him up and took a death photo and circulated that. Um, and the Pinkerton agent that had been trailing Curry forever uh, was a man by the name of Lowell Spence and he wanted to see it for himself and so he came to Glenwood Springs and dug him up again uh, just to make sure that that it was in fact Kid Curry and you know not somebody else and uh, and it was him Uh, and we've we have captured um, two separate um, disembodied voices disembodied voice clips um, that we believe to be Kid Curry. Um, we captured them near uh, his grave marker, and we were talking about him at the time they were recorded. Um, and so, you know, we've got we've got those in conjunction with, you know, the location and the story, and and so we're we're pretty confident that that's you know who who we've been dealing with at that location. Oh, absolutely, and I mean, yeah. You know, I, I... And we've got another one, too, that uh, was disinterred and brought back in, too, that was one of the family members. It was the Wilhoyt Mill and the Wilhoyt family that came in and, and built all this and had the farm and all the slaves and everything that were here mm-hmm. at that time. And he and Governor Horton married uh, their daughter. But they had a son that was in the war that went to Chattanooga, and uh, he had a manservant and everything. That was, and and he, him and the manservant at the time were making fun of people that had measles because, you know, like – all people dying of these little, you know, spots on them and everything. They thought it was funny and making jokes and everything. Well, he kind of, uh, while he was in Chattanooga, he he wound up catching the measles and he died. Oh dear. So they buried him. So mm-hmm. they buried him. So the manservant come back and told them, and they sent the manservant back to get him and bring him back to bury him. So they here on the family farm. So they dug him up and brought him back. Well, when he come back, the manservant caught the measles. And so the manservant gave the measles to his two sons, and all three of them, the, uh, them died. So they thought so much of the manservant, he is actually buried uh, next to the son that he took care of. Uh, him and his two sons are buried in the same family cemetery. Oh, wow. So, yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's a lot of history here at this park, a lot of things going on. Um, the house was used. They had, didn't have a Civil War battle here close to us uh and on, but um, between Lewisburg and and the farm and everything, about oh, about seven miles, they had a skirmish. So they took the wounded from the skirmish and brought them up to the the family home here and operated on them. And when they tore the home down, they actually found the blood and stuff under the flooring and everything, where they actually had the surgical hospital there in the home. Oh wow! So it's got all kinds of ties to it. That is. That, you know, for me, you know, being a history major and everything, you know, I find all of that, you know, absolutely fascinating and intriguing. Uh, 
you know, because, you know, you you read about stuff like that, you hear about stuff like that, but, you know, that, that actually happened. And, oh, absolutely. And so, uh, you know, it's it's really cool to, you know, to hear the stories and and uh, kind of relive history, if you will. Uh, absolutely, and that's what we enjoy. We enjoy giving the walking tours and, and teaching the history of the park and letting them know what's happened to the rangers at different locations, our employees. You know, we've the restaurant, some of the employees have had, had knives moved and, and couldn't find them the next day in the same location that they disappeared from or uh, the bar off the freezer that they used to lock it at night leaned up, come flying across. They have things set off the shelf and things on the shelf turned upside down. And the latest that we heard last uh, Saturday night when we did an investigation, the ladies in the restaurant says, oh, let us tell you what's happening now. Said, uh, ice, uh, drink station number three said if we put the ice scoop on top of it, it throws it off in the floor or throws it at us. Says it doesn't like anything sitting up there on top of the ice machine there. So they quit putting things on the ice machine. They said, but the weirdest thing is for the last few weeks, a couple of times a week, we have had an order for a Caesar's chicken wrap come into the back. And said so when it comes in and they, they make the sandwich and everything, it goes to a table that nobody's sitting at and nobody's ordered one in the restaurant. So they not they can't figure out how they're getting these mysterious orders of a Caesar chicken wrap. Wow. <laughs> That's really wow. cool. So, would you say then that that that's your favorite location to investigate, or or do you have a, a another one that's just your all time favorite? Oh, I, you know, over the years, it's hard to pick just one. I mean, I've mm-hmm. had so many experiences at different locations. Uh, part of our team, our our team went to uh, Brushy Mountain Penitentiary. Uh, Nick Groff had a, a public investigation, and we actually went up there with Nick and. Uh, I mean, it was amazing. Uh, um, they were talking about a Cherokee gentleman that was in in prison there, and so uh, Nick was talking and everything. And and uh, there was a lady from the Cherokee Nation in in Oklahoma, and then she was talking about being from Oklahoma. So I spoke some Cherokee to her, and Nick overheard, and he said, "Oh, you speak Cherokee?" And I said, "Just a little bit, not a whole lot." And uh, so he said, would you come down into the solitary and we'll take the geoport? And we actually went in and started, I started, you know, speaking a little Cherokee. And Geo actually started speaking Cherokee back. So wow. he, did a Facebook live, he did a Facebook live with us down, down there doing that. And he said, you know, everywhere I've been, I've had several different languages, but this is the first time I've had it speak a Native American language back to me. So, I mean, it was pretty cool. Wow. So, you know, I like, I like brushy. Um. Our teammates had a, a great time there. We just, you know, just went. A lot of times, you know, we, we get caught up with doing the public investigation or investigations for others. But sometimes in our downtime, we like to take team trips and go to different locations so that we mm-hmm. can just actually have have some fun for ourselves, you know. Right. No, that makes perfect sense. And uh, we're going to go ahead and take our next break just a couple of minutes early, uh, but when we come back, we're going to have more with Ronnie, so stay tuned, folks. You're listening to Periscope Uncensored on WBHM Digital Broadcasting, and we will be right back. Welcome back to Periscope Uncensored on WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Alabama. I'm Clarissa Vasquez, and in the co-pilot seat this evening is the man whose voice is smoother than ice cream, Mr. Joe White. How you doing, everybody? And we're having a great time talking to our guest tonight. Uh, Ronnie Headley is the lead investigator and founder of Tennessee Paranormal. And uh, Ronnie, we've only got about 20 minutes left with you. Um, But uh, you mentioned uh, during the break um, that while not necessarily paranormal, um, you, too, are an author. So uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, some of the books you have out and where people can find them? Uh, I've got some Amazon Kindle books out that uh, is like an English to Cherokee uh, translation for the words dictionary. Uh, I've got some cookbooks, Native American cookbooks out there. I've got uh, uh, brain tanning 
uh, Native American, American brain tanning hides and, and other techniques and uh, a couple other little books out there like uh, Cherokee Treaties and that kind of thing. Um, so if you just go to Amazon Kindle and look for Ronald Firehawk Headley, you'll find them under there. Very cool. And so obviously your your Native American heritage um, inspired those. Have you thought about writing a uh, a paranormal themed book uh, based on your on your Native American heritage and some of your experiences? Actually, I'm in the process. I have taken some courses that are, you know, paranormal courses here in the United States are few and far in between. Mm-hmm. And uh, so uh, I actually found some courses in England and took some courses in uh, uh, paranormal investigation, uh, a diploma in paranormal investigation, a paranormal uh, and uh, advanced management and investigation course. Uh, and I also took a demonology course, uh, mm-hmm. got a diploma in demonology out of England. So I'm in the process of trying to put an uh, a, a e-book together or a course together that we can uh, offer something here in the United States with uh, more knowledge on how to how to get into it and and use it as a, a professional aspect versus, you know, just a bunch of friends going out on the weekends to see what we can find. Um, Outstanding. And one of the biggest things I always encourage to, uh, we get a lot of people here looking for, you know, um, we're famous for the Chapel Hill light, like I was talking to you on break a while ago about mm-hmm. the Chapel Hill light and everything. And we got a lot of people that want to go trespass and everything and, and look at it. And, you know, there's things that, like waterways and, and highways and railways and all, after 911 fall, uh, anything commerce falls under Homeland Security, so it's a different ball of wax of when we were kids walking down the tracks and putting nickels and pennies on it, watching them squish, you know. Right. So, so uh, I always encourage people, you know, no matter where you go, whether it's somebody's property or even a, uh, a town cemetery, get permission to go in before you go in trespass and things like that. So. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. That's something we cannot stress enough. No, oh, exactly, and that's why I always try to try to mention that because you can get in so much trouble so easy, you know. And especially with it falling under Homeland Security, I mean, if they want to, they can char- charge you with a, a, a terroristic act of being on a, you know, when just being on the tra- uh, train tracks. Oh yeah. So, uh, always try to encourage people to do that. Even here in Tennessee, the cemeteries in Tennessee, it's illegal to play any games or anything else after dark in a cemetery. But if we go to some of these historical cemeteries, like, you know, with the, the battlefields and, and, and things like that, so if you go in and talk to the police departments and, you know, the rangers and things like that, they'll give you permission to go in and do it. But right. you just have to go around in the right way and ask. Yeah, and right. and be respectful of their answer. You know, if they if they tell you no, you know, you have to you ha- you have to be respectful of that and and you know. Exactly. Can't just like, go and do it anyway. No, no, you can't. Um, you know, if you go in and talk to them and they say no, just say thank you. You know, and you never know until you ask, and that's all they can say is yes or no. You know, so. Right. Now, Ronnie, um, your opinion? Do you think that the experiences that you've had in, like, other investigators out in the field, um, do you think that it's it's do you think that ghosts are coming through a, a like a different dimension, or do you think it could be like a a time slip? I think there's two different types of hauntings. I think that, and I like to explain it as you know, uh, like a residual haunting and and an intelligent haunting. Residual haunting, I would like to refer to as like everybody's seen the movie Groundhog Day, so it's like being caught in Groundhog Day. Same thing every day. You got that energy. And that's what it did. You know, people say, well, I saw it walk through a wa- an apparition walk through a wall, or I was out at this battlefield and I only saw half of one, you know. Well, those things go through. That wall may not have been there in its time frame, and that might have just been what it did every day, just moving. It's oblivious to you and what's going on around it. And, uh, you know, if it was a battlefield, that might have been in an, uh, a, a trench that it fought out of, you know, and you're only seeing it because at that time the rest of it was in the trench. Uh, so, you know, 
I look at it that way, and then I look at the intelligent hauntings are the ones where we get the EVPs or it moves objects or, you know, it answers questions for us intelligently. So um, that's just the way I look at the things. Cool. Very cool. Um, so... And again, my questions are are leaving me. You, folks, you're going to have to forgive me tonight. Uh, if you couldn't already tell, I'm not feeling well, uh, and so my my questions are are escaping me, and and everything's uh, going to the dogs tonight. But uh, uh, Joe, I'm sure you've got more questions lined up that you want to ask Ronnie. So I'm going to kind of hand the floor over to you for a few more minutes. Okay. Um, for people that want to come down to the state park, is there a website that people can go to so they can get more information on that? Sure. Uh, it's uh, TennesseeParanormal.net. So, um, our, But we would uh, we would love to have you know people contact us. Uh, I've got an email also. It's tnparanormal dot spirits of the past at gmail dot com. And if there's if anybody wants to come do the tours or anything, if those if you'll contact me there and tell us that you heard it on the show, we'll we'll give you a discount and everything for it. How's that? Oh, cool. Outstanding. You heard it here, folks. Yeah, we're Tennessee Paranormal Spirits of the Past. That's what we, we're Tennessee Paranormal, but Tennessee Paranormal Spirits of the Past is our tour at the park. So you can look us up that way, too. And we're Tennessee Paranormal no. Spirits of the Past group on, on Facebook. Now, is this is this uh, a daytime tour, or do you give ghost tours at night? or? We start the walking tour at 5 p.m., and it goes to 7 p.m., and then at 7 okay. p.m., those that just took the walking tour, they'll go home. The others, we're already set up in the cabin that we saw the apparition, that the park ranger saw the apparition in. We've got all of our equipment set up in there. We go in, explain to the people, you know, what all the equipment is that we're using that night, how it operates, and uh, what they possibly can hear, what they might not hear, what they might see, what, you know. We we tell them you know it's not like uh, a dog and pony show and they're performing for you you know you know you you might hear something you might see something there's no guarantees but at the same time we've never failed to get forty to seventy five EVPs out of a out of a, a night. Uh, we've wow! Had people touched. Really? We've had people touched. We've had things moved. Uh, orbs on the camera, and I know everybody you know on orbs. Everybody has a different opinion on orbs. But if you've got one that's like bouncing all over the place and going through walls and you've got a camera on the other side and you see it go through that wall, it's hard to say that's a piece of dust. You know? Uh, so we do things like wow. that. But on our investigations, we get your email and anything that we've captured. Uh, we email you any of the EVPs and everything that we find. And we encourage the people to ask questions themselves. So. You know, what's the best way to, to believe in something, if you're kind of skeptic on it, is to come out and ask a question and actually have it answered. You know, you hear your voice ask it, and then you hear the whisper behind it with the answer that you've asked. So, you know, that's kind of what we try to do. That's so people have, been, people have been scratched there then, obviously. They haven't been scratched. I mean, that. we haven't had any things really bad. We've had them touched. Uh, we had a gentleman that was kind of skeptic came out. We went out to, like I told you, where the uh, the haunted spring and everything is, and uh, he's standing there by beside his fiance and everything. And he all of a sudden he just takes off running and screaming, "Something touched me! Something touched me!" And she's running behind him, trying to drag him back into the group, you know. And um, we've had other people touched, uh, you know, something like something moved my hair. Uh, We've had, uh, we use a boo buddy bear and mm -hmm. uh, we've had boo buddy turned around. You know, we'd leave it sitting one way and it'd turn around the other way, you know. Do you find boo buddy to be as obnoxious as I do? 
Oh, I hate uh, I hate <laughs> just when he starts going off like somebody shut the bear up, right? Right. <laughs> I mean, I love him for a tool, but sometimes it's just like, oh, will he just be quiet for a right. moment? <laughs> somebody shut him up. Take the batteries mm-hmm. out. Exactly. Yeah. But, I mean, you know, it's a good tool. Oh. It's a good tool. And everybody sees him on TV, and everybody loves Boo Buddy, right? Yeah. Yeah, you know, we were really excited when we when we got Boo Buddy in, and after the first time using it, it was like, okay, yeah, no, I'm over this. Mm-hmm. Oh, I was the same way. It's like, oh, I can't wait to get him, and then, oh, God, what did I do? <laughs> right. But, uh, we have uh, we have tons and tons and tons of equipment that we bring out, though. That's uh, fantastic. Some of our team members... Some of our team members have got the Huff Paranormal uh, Huff Huff boxes, Paranormal boxes, mm-hmm. and we've got uh, you know we've got Geo ports, uh, SB sevens. Uh, there's a gentleman in England that builds a lot of stuff, Simon Cox, and I mean he does a wonderful job, and uh, I get a lot of stuff built in England and shipped in. Very. He's, he's kind of on the cutting edge. He he kind of just you know he looks for stuff. And, and build stuff constantly and always trying to improve the next round. So uh, that's I, that's my go-to on it. And what is he what is he building? Like, can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Well, you know, you, if you've seen uh, Nick and them with the geo ports and everything, he builds one that looks identical to it, does the same thing, but he calls it an afterlight because he didn't want to get in with, you know, the geo port. It's got like a reverb pedal and reversing and, you know, all this kind of stuff in it. Sounds just like Geo, has the lights that light up just like Geo and everything else. And it's in an antique radio case. Um, he makes one, I call it Baby Geo. It does the same thing, but he takes one of the, the mirrored Bluetooth speakers that's got all the lights in it and everything and did the same thing, mm-hmm. put a small reverb pedal and, and reversing and all in it too. So, uh, you know, I kind of... He uh, he makes the adjustable sweeps and everything on it too, so it's pretty cool. Cool. And he also uh, takes like a like a, a TV antenna that they use over a little TV antenna box and converts it to a rim pod. So you know, uses the antenna and everything, and uh, has little lights down the front of it. So he he just like thinking outside the box on some of the newest stuff with the. He's always trying to improve what he's what he's got on the market mm-hmm. yeah i may have to get in touch with him and see about you know procuring some new yeah, equipment he's got a web page. I'll, I'll send you a link to the web page and everything yeah that'd be great yeah because i'm i'm always looking for you know something that can you know benefit the field uh, oh absolutely you know you know like go ahead like Nick, I was talking to him, and I said, man, I love Geo when I was down in the cell with him. I said, how much is it? He's about 2500 And so Simon built me this one for about half of what that one was shipped in to the U.S. So, oh, wow. You know. mm-hmm. That's a good deal right there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So. Yeah, yeah there's always... Uh... To benefit the fields, it's always good to get some cutting edge technology to grow the field. Oh, exactly. And like our SLS cameras, David, which is one of the arson investigators I was talking about, he um, he came up with you know taking the Connect camera and we put it on a lightweight tripod along with a, a, a charger, you know, like. Um, where you can plug in and it has 110 and you know battery jump box and all that little small small mm-hmm. one mm-hmm. and we we mounted that mm-hmm. you know he mounted those to the the tripod and then put a uh we use a, a small tablet on there and has a tablet holder so we can just like pick it up it's lightweight carry it from place to place and set it up you know so it makes it a lot easier to do that so you know david's kind of my techie guy too where he comes up with quite a few things and <laughs> uh, just amazing some of the things he comes up with. Aren't those tech guys great? Oh yeah, I'm telling you. It really is. 
<laughs> so we've only got uh, a few minutes left with you, Ronnie. Uh, so again, for our listeners, um, what is the best contact method if, if somebody wants to get a hold of you or uh, get a hold of uh, Tennessee Paranormal? Um, what's the best way they can find out more about you or or give you a give you a contact? Just contact us at uh, TN Paranormal uh, dot Spirits of the Past at Gmail dot com, or you can call me. Uh, my home number is nine three one three six four four six four seven, or send me a text at two zero five two three zero three six seven eight. Outstanding, and you guys also have a social media presence. Yes. We're uh, on Facebook with uh, Tennessee Paranormal Spirits of the Past group. Uh, you know, we've uh, since we've started the uh, Facebook uh, August to be a year, we've got almost thirteen hundred people in the group at this point. But uh, wow, we, yeah, we we share things. We get people, you know, from all over Australia and England and. Scotland and everything that come in and they'll post things on the page of what they've captured and things and it's kind of a way for you know uh, people that are are new to the paranormal and have questions we go in and answer and try to lead them in directions that they can you know get information to start getting started and working in it and all the way to you know other other teams and saying you know look at this and or we're sharing this and trying to get second opinions on things. Sorry about that. My phone is sending out an Amber Alert. (laughs) Uh, I know how that is. (laughs) So, and it's not even in my state. It's out of Wyoming. (laughs) Don't know why it came to, don't know why it came to Western Colorado if it's out of Cheyenne, Wyoming, but. Really? Yep. (laughs) So. That's the funny thing about, you know, technology and and cell phones and everything. It's like even when you've got your phone set on silent, those Amber Alerts still come through. (laughs) Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. (laughs) So I hope they find the child that they're looking for, but not in the middle of my radio show. (laughs) (laughs) But... Well, Ronnie, we want to thank you so much for being a great guest on the show tonight. And again, I apologize for... for, uh, you know, losing my train of thought and and uh, and not being at my best tonight, but it was great to have you on the show and you know learning more about what you guys are doing and and uh, you know how you're how you're really enriching the field of paranormal investigation. You know this was a treat for us, guys. I really appreciate it. I was honored to be here with you guys and uh, you know get down this way. Come join us on an investigation. We'd love to have you guys come in. You know. Yeah. Like that just get in touch with us. That may happen more sooner than later. We're we're gonna have to check the travel schedule, but uh, but that that could yeah. be in the very near future. We're good. So, uh, but yeah, uh, best of luck to you and and to the team. And uh, you know, if if you stumble across something, you know, absolutely incredible, uh, you know, give us a shout. We'd love to hear about it. No, absolutely, I sure will. Thank you. And. Uh, and you know take take care you know be be safe out there because uh you know what we do is not exactly the safest profession exactly <laughs> not, so, it's like i tell everybody it's you know it's not the ghosts and the demons and everything it's sometimes it's the buildings and the conditions of places that we go into that you got right out after too yeah definitely so well thank you again for being such a great guest well, on the you. show and and uh, best of luck to you guys. Thank you so much. All right, have, have a great day. have Bye. a great night. All right. Bye. Ronnie Headley, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, again, you can find them on uh, Tennessee Paranormal Spirits of the Past dot net, and uh, you can also find them uh, Tennessee Paranormal Spirits of the Past on social media. Uh, and uh, you know what a great guest. He was, you know, the, the history geek in me was just going bonkers. Uh, You know, as soon as he started talking about, you know, the, the state park and, and stuff like that, that was, 
that was really cool. I was, you know, like like a little dog. You know, my ears just went. <laughs> <laughs> So. Yeah, definitely. I got much respect for him and and Tennessee Paranormal. Yeah, definitely. You know, it's like a very polite guy, and I'm sure that 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 he's the same way out in the field. Yeah, you know, and and it's like very few that you actually see that are that are that polite. Yeah, definitely. That's not something that you encounter. Every day, certainly not in this field, you know, in the in the era where, you know, provocation has become um, is perceived to be acceptable. So and on that note, it is time for our final break of the evening. But when we come back more with Joe and I, so stay tuned. You're listening to Periscope Uncensored on WBHM Digital Broadcasting, and we will be right back. Welcome back to Periscope Uncensored on WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Alabama. I'm Clarissa Vasquez, and of course in the co-pilot seat this evening is the key master to my gatekeeper, Mr. Joe Hoyt. Hey, hey. Hey, hey. What an awesome show, huh? Yeah. Yeah, he was great to talk to, and, and I feel horrible that, you know, that you know, that I I feel horrible that I feel horrible. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, but there's yeah. really not much you can do about it. If you don't feel good, you don't feel well, you know, so. Yeah, that's true. Uh, I'm trying, though. I'm here. So, can't ask for much more than that. <laughs> but, uh, no, I, you know, we we may have to see if we can put put uh, him and his team on the on the travel schedule uh, coming up uh, because uh, you know I, I don't know if, if the travels are going to get us anywhere near Tennessee but they might and so I, I think it would be cool to you know go out there and pay Ronnie and his team a visit I think that would be great yeah absolutely I'd be willing to do that. Yeah. So we'll have to we'll have to take a look see and you know see what that's what what that's going to look like in the way of, you know, time and mileage and money. <laughs> it's yeah. like it's like this trip is getting more and more extensive by the day. But you know, but that's what happens, you know, when you when you go on a trip of this magnitude, you know, you've got places you want to go and people you want to see and things you want to do and 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 so, you know, that it, it happens. It does happen. But like you said, it feels like the trip is getting bigger and bigger and bigger the whole t- the whole time. So, yeah. But yeah. But what a trip, right? Right. And I'm not talking the psychedelic kind. No, no. <laughs> but, It'll be almost like your uh, paranormal road trip last August. Oh, the Great American Paranormal Road Trip, yeah. Where we covered uh, 24 states in 15 days. Yeah, I was so jealous. I know you were. <laughs> Yeah. But, you know, part of that road trip consisted of, you know, going out there and seeing you. So Yeah. You know, so so you got to be part of the the Great American Paranormal Road Trip. Yeah, but less than not even 12 hours later, you 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 got up from Yeah, we were gone. <laughs> And and next thing I knew, it's like within like twelve hours, you were in Gettysburg. I'm like, what? Yeah. It was like you were just here, and then all of a sudden you're in Gettysburg. And it's like unreal. Yeah. Put that pedal to the metal, huh? Dang. You, know, you know, when we drove from Massachusetts to Gettysburg, I slept. I did. Oh, I, sure. I I slept all the way to Gettysburg. You know, there were three other drivers, and so, so I slept going to Gettysburg. Uh, I was so exhausted. 
you know, Chris and I had just released the book and we, uh, the Pareidolia book. And so we had been up uh, signing copies of the book after the investigation at SK Pierce. Uh, you know, we each ordered, um, I think I ordered like 20, co- I think we each ordered 20 copies of uh-huh. the book. And so we were signing each other's book copies so that, you know, we would have copies signed by both of us, you know, to give out or to sell or what have you. Right. And, and so after we had investigated that night, you know, then I was, you know, up signing books and, and, you know, and so when we went to Gettysburg, you know, I slept, <laughs> I, I slept on the way to Gettysburg and, so you two got no sleep at all that night. Um, I don't remember what time I made it back to the room with the girls. Um, it was it was really 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 late. <laughs> uh, you know, because well, you know how Chris and I, you know, we just get to talking, and you know, so on top of the fact, you know, that we're, you know, we're excited, you know, we just launched this new book and. And, and everything, you know, and then, you know, you've got writer's cramp from signing all of those books and, <laughs> you know, it's sleep right. deprivation on top of it. It was, it was crazy. Yeah. Cause I saw the, the photograph that morning, mm-hmm. with the sun glaring and you guys are standing there holding the book up and. Yeah. Trying to smile and it's like sleep. Yeah, it's like, you know, we're happy about this book, but you know, we really want some sleep. I don't know if he slept at all. I I really don't. And and, and it was God, what a trip though. I, we let's see, we investigated in New Orleans. And in Savannah, and in Massachusetts, in Gettysburg, and then uh, we also did uh, Lemp Mansion in St. Louis. Those were the actual investigation locations that we did. Oh, and we went and looked for the Mothman in West Virginia. Yes. Uh, and you know, and we we stopped, you know, in some other places, and and. You know, but those, you know, that's where we, where we actually chased ghosts and was in those, you know, in just those few states, you know, the majority of the trip was spent driving. (laughs) Right. That's another location I like to go. I'd like to go to Savannah. Oh, Savannah is great. Savannah uh... is the city built on it, on the dead. Yes. They actually claim that that is the most haunted city. I believe it. I totally so believe I. it. And and we stayed in. Um, uh, oh, I forget the name of the hotel that we stayed in, um, but we we stayed in Savannah's most haunted hotel, and it's actually on the top 10 list of haunted hotels in the world. I believe it. And it was, it it was incredible. You know, we got to, we got to go and hang out with uh, Patrick Burns from uh, haunting evidence. It was a Mm -hmm. TV show that was, that was on, uh, it was on uh, true TV for a while back when it was court TV. And so I uh, got to go hang out with my buddy Patrick and and uh, we took his haunted history tour of Savannah and and that was that was incredible. You know, a lot of lot of walking, but you know, it was that was a great tour. No, they had they had four great fires there, right? I don't know how many fires they had in Savannah. I know, I, I know during the Civil War, you know, Savannah burned and burned again, and then almost burned, and then didn't burn, and and you know, Savannah was very, very active, you know, during that time period, 
and so it was a uh, you know a lot of uh, geographic psychic trauma in that area you know on top of everything else that they've got going on down there so you know it's a great place folks you know if you get the chance you know go check it out because it it's worth it yeah so and uh we are almost out of time uh, we do not have uh a show next week um because the the big road trip was supposed to start next week but it got postponed um but given how i'm feeling this evening uh, we're going to we're going to continue with that week off and uh and then hit the ground running in 2 weeks so uh, i believe cat's going to play an archive but if you missed an episode of Periscope Uncensored. Uh, you can always find the archives on Spreaker and on our YouTube page. Uh, just look up Periscope Radio, P A R A dash scope radio. Um, and uh, you can find all of our archives uh, for the last. Uh, since November. Four months. Yeah, since since November. For the last four months, you can find all of our archives from then. And, uh, and you know, listen to uh, the great guests and the great information, you know, that we've had, uh, you know, for the last several months. Yeah, it's been a fun ride. Yeah. Just keeps getting better, doesn't it? Yes. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> and if you've got uh, a guest suggestion for us, uh, feel free to email us at para scope at mail dot com. And yes, we'll, and we'll see we'll about do our very best trying to get them on. Yep. We'll we'll do our best. And you know, people you know, I, I get requests all the time, you know, get you know, get Zach or get Jason or, you know, get chip coffee. And, you know, it's just like, not that we haven't tried guys, you know, it's just, you know, they're, they're busy. And, you know, and so, you know, we kind of like talking to some of the lesser known investigators because, you know, people don't know a lot about them and they, they learn something new and, you know, maybe discover a new favorite. So, Yes. So, but and uh on that note we're gonna go ahead and call it a night. But uh we wanna thank Ronnie Headley and Tennessee Paranormal for being such a great guest on the show. And again, no show next week, folks. Uh but uh we will be back uh in two weeks. And uh I couldn't tell you right now who our guest is to save my life because that's how that's how scatterbrained I am right now. Um, uh, I, I actually, I think it's, uh, I think it's Mike Brody, uh, the paranormal comedian. In fact, I know, I know that's who it is. Uh, paranormal stand-up comic Mike Brody is going to be our guest, uh, in two weeks. So you definitely want to check that out because not only is he absolutely hilarious, um, but he's also a very brilliant investigator. And he's he's got some stories to tell. So be sure to tune in uh, in two weeks, 9 p.m. Eastern, here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. So for Joe, Kat, the WBHM family of hosts, and myself, we want to wish everyone a fantastic evening. And may all of your ghosts be friendly. Stay spooky, everyone. Have a good night.